surviving? Sure. You surviving? Yeah, I'm trying to. Anything left of your life? Not much. Not much. I'm sorry. I want to bring my uh, forty-five thousand dollar job down to about eleven hundred. You have a family too, I guess. I've been, been trying to get myself upgraded. It's mostly giving me right now is fifty percent. There's nothing I can do. I start to do something, my hands start shaking so bad I can't do anything with them. But it's easy to find a job now in this economy anyway, even, huh? even if you were feeling, feeling 100%, right? Right. Plus, anybody over 40 now, they don't want it for uh, 20, 25, bet you, 40. You bet your life they do. Yeah. So you're in a very tight box here. How many kids do you have? One. And one kid. Yeah. He, he graduates in a few months. From? High school. High school. You want to go to? College, but I didn't have the money. I think, he, think he's going in the Navy and take their training and run some college while he's in there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good anyway. And your wife, is she surviving all this? Mm -hmm. She's doing better than I am. She is? Yeah. Uh -huh. she, she's, she's been a little bit. She works herself, though. No, sir. She doesn't. She can't work. She's got a bad back. She has a bad back. Yeah, when we were first married, she kept having back problems, so we went to a doctor there. He's since departed, but she had what they call deteriorating discs in her back. And he said she could have an operation, but there was a 50 50 chance she'd be in the wheelchair the rest of her life. So she said she'd rather have a good money and she'd have to work. So I said, well, hey, I'll just do this way. I can, I can have a hot meal. Well, come in at night because you know, thirty-five thousand is a chicken feed. I, I live well off that, mm -hmm. and I figured this. And this way, I always have a hot meal when I want to go on. Mm -hmm. That's why it's been. So she didn't ever had the operation. No, but she still has a lot of pain in the back. Yeah. She does. Mm -hmm. Oh, in fact, I I sweep the floor and do some vacuum for her just some bad times. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing nothing, so it won't kill me either. You know. The two of you have had a lot of bum luck, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Is she still considering having the operation? No, I don't believe so. Not now at 42, 40, 43. Mm -hmm. So w what you were told was that if she had the operation, there was a 50% chance she wouldn't ever do anything. Right. Mm -hmm. She didn't get this long, just, you know, she, she knows her limitations. Mm -hmm. and, and she's, most of the time, uh, she has very little trouble with it because I won't let her love it, nothing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the biggest thing I like is she's always there for me. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, your foundation of your life is slipping away now, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's done it slipped away real. The, fa the family's gone too, your own family. Well, they're, they're behind me that, but I don't, I don't even, even enjoy seeing my family anymore. Is that that hurts me. I don't hurt the family. I always was outgoing and uh, mm -hmm. enjoy people, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know more. I don't like to be with people. Mm -hmm. I like to stay as far away from groups most of the time. I do go out shopping with the wife, but I don't stay too long because I don't, I just, I don't like being with people. Well, she may not feel very sociable either at this point. You know, with this back pain, right? Yeah. A lot of times she can hardly get out of bed with it. A lot of times she can hardly get out of bed. So what uh, once was a pretty active kind of human situation has become very confined, hasn't it? Yeah. It makes me feel bad because I can't do nothing. Mm -hmm. Your own father and mother are gone now. Yeah. Mom still here. She just retired. Dad been gone for 14 years now. About 14 years. Yeah. He died right around 55. He drowned. Died. Emphysema. Oh, 
in 55. Yeah, heart attack. Mm -hmm. See, and so she's been, your mother's been on, on her own for a good many years. Yes, now. oh yeah. He got a brother that lives with her. He's he's bachelor. He's thirty three years old. He uh, hasn't found anybody yet, I guess. So he he's always there for whatever mom wants. So she has that kind of support anyway. Mm -hmm. Did your father leave her enough money so she's able to? Not live very long no. He, he was at. I understand now they got a pretty good pension plan. Back then, he worked heavy equipment, bulldozer, crane, all that. You made a lot of money, but the pension plan wasn't so hot. Mm -hmm. And he was in a spot where it was hot. He, he didn't leave her very well. She went to work herself. Just she just now uh, uh, quit. She's 60, mm -hmm. 65, 66. Boys got together and told her that by God, one way or another, we, we'd help her out. Mm -hmm. And she worked all her life. And the last few years, we wanted to work. Mm -hmm. And you're the oldest of the brothers. No, I'm the third. Third? It's a big bunch of them. Yeah, there's four boys. And the oldest is now? Uh, Fred, he'll be 50, and then John, 49, and mm -hmm. I'm 42, Kyle's 30. Kyle's the one who's living with, with her. Right. Mm -hmm. So you all got together and promised that she could retire now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't pay one person very much. Mm -hmm. You're not in a very good position yourself at this point to help no, her out, are you? No. Can you, are your older brother's in a better spot to help her? Yeah, the one older brother, he isn't married either, and he has his own house, new car, and as he's been at a place called Barbara and Coleman's in Rockford. He's been there 30 years. He's never been married or anything. He, he, he helps the biggest part of the time on that. Mm -hmm. Like my once he gets for. And then the youngest brother is there to help her on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Man. Well, that's something, isn't it? No, no sisters in this family? Just two, four boys. Right. Nice. And you all been in the service at one time or another? Uh, no, I uh, got one brother that, that the one that's uh, home now, his uh, uh, body was, he was one of the, what they call a change of life babies. Mm -hmm. His heart's on the wrong side and everything. He can do about it. He's the youngest. He's the yeah, youngest he's hard to sit on the wrong side, so he has to watch some of the stuff he does too. Now he's born with one ear, and he, so he goes up every so often to some place in Minnesota where they make make an, an ear to. It looks pretty, pretty realistic. Hmm. Now, every few, few years he does that. Well, that probably hasn't improved his social confidence though, no. over the years. No, it doesn't help either. But the biggest problem right now is you, right? Yeah. Is how to get your life back on some kind of stable basis. Isn't it? Not give anything to. Yeah. I spent over three months here last year. I've already been here a month this year. Mm -hmm. That's getting old too. I'm tired. So tired of being here. All I want to be is my family. Mm -hmm. And. Be the way I used to be. Sure. But at least be, at least feel a little better to get back with your wife and the, this kid before the kid goes away, right? Mm -hmm. What to do? That's the question. I mean, they've tried a lot of medicines. And yeah. Uh, yeah. The last one seemed to work pretty good for a couple months. I don't know. Maybe it's just. I I I, I don't know. But it didn't. That was the only medicine I found that worked, and I was I wasn't in here for two or three months, something like that. And the rest of the medicines never helped at all. So it seemed like it didn't do a thing for me or react, you know, the wrong way on me or something. And this one medicine did help, or helped at least for, I say, a couple months or so. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're young enough, man, so you gotta. Good many years left in your program. Yeah, right? that's part of most me. I can't work. Yeah. Probably hope you don't want to shoot yourself or something. Yeah, well, I wouldn't. I, things like that run across my mind. And I bet they have, right? I, I, I feel so lousy and so bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I 
and then I think about my family. It, I won't hurt them. I, I, I mm -hmm. cut that back out. Well, your wife too would be, yeah. be helpless without you. Can't do the housework you said or anything of that kind. What's going to happen if the doctors don't figure out some way to make you feel better? No, no. Mm -hmm. you're, you're asking me a question. I, I, I've got my, my thousand times. Ask yourself a thousand times. That's right. What should you do? Small town, and there's, there's nothing there. You know? mm -hmm. During a the summer, maybe you get you can go on work. side work, you know, things like that. You're not going to make That's any money out of that. Mm -hmm. You still got the, your house? Ah, uh, we rent. You rent? Yeah. I see. So you don't have any equity that's accumulated in the house either? No. Mm -hmm. So you really have to have a certain amount of money coming in just to pay the rent, right? right. Yeah, he, rent comes around and he wants his money. That's right. They're not going to be very charitable at that moment, are they? Uh, I, you know, just like it's easier if you had a house with a mortgage paid off or something. Yeah, like that, 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 that so would can live on relatively little then, but yeah. this, this situation is impossible. You got a car and stuff? Yeah, that's what's getting fixed right now. I couldn't fix it, a buddy might fix it for me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want any twires or starter or something, it's just, it won't start. Yeah, can your wife drive still? Or she no, can, she doesn't drive. She can't drive at all. Uh, she never, never learned, or had no reason to. She said she just would not learn anyhow. Mm -hmm. It makes her nervous, so mm -hmm. she never learned how to drive. And so this, she's at home alone with the, with the kid, right? Mm -hmm. And the kid's going to leave, presumably, pretty soon. Yeah. So she'll be by herself and she can't drive. Right. So how the hell, who's going to get the groceries? I don't know. You worry. Hmm? The neighbors only do that for so long. Too. Right. You, you know, you can only be ask people so long, to, and then it gets old for them too. You know. Oh, sure. And you don't like to be obligated that way. Right. Right. Okay. I got nice neighbors, man, but I don't want to uh, uh, abuse hmm? myself on them. You know. And if you if you stay on this fifty percent disability thing, that's not gonna that's not gonna be enough for you to live on, is it? No, it's not, sir. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm trying real hard for him to upgrade. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm fighting one now. They have it in Chicago. I went in there. They mm -hmm. checked me over. That uh, was back in October. They they sent me a, a deal stating that uh, you don't have to fight this. We are checking it over now, so do not do anything further. Mm -hmm. That was I still haven't heard nothing. I don't know how, long ago was, how long ago was that? Um, they sent me that letter in December. First party of December. Oh, it was 87? Yeah. How long, do you know how long they usually take? Uh, well, I understand a couple of months. It's been that plus already. Whether they're going to let you have it or whether, you know. But they, they wrote me a letter saying, you have received your, your uh, deal, want to be upgraded. Um, we will look over this. You do not have to do anything as of yet. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, they're looking, they're, or at least the way I took it, they're looking it over mm -hmm. and they, they let me know how things are going. But how far do I let it go? Mm -hmm. well, how long can you afford to let it go? I can't, either way. Mm -hmm. 
people get cancer. It's not a, not a situation. And another awful thing is that even if you did feel better, you wouldn't want to tell anybody because that might affect the kind of judgment they make, right? Oh yeah, it, it's, a, it's a catch twenty two it walk situation. In there and told them I felt good. They take they, a little they bit. Would, they take a little bitch head away from you, yep. right? Yeah. Terrible situation. You can't afford to anything like that unless unless John D. Rockefeller comes along and gives yeah. you million, gives you a million dollars or something. Yeah, yeah. It's not likely to be doing that. From no. what I can tell, huh? Eh? You think you've got my sex life ruined? Got your sex life ruined too. No, I can't. For eight months now. Uh -huh. that, that doesn't go to make a man feel very well either, I'll tell you. Sure it doesn't. So, I mean, I don't know how your wife responds to that either. No, she she does real well. She, you know, never pressed me or anything about it. And makes me feel worse probably does her. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, well, the men usually respond more worried more about that than we would do as a rule. Just seems like everything I do, it gets worse. Mm -hmm. and, and I've tried everything. Mm -hmm. If somebody suggests something, hell, I'll try it. Mm -hmm. Nothing seems to work for me. Mm -hmm. Are you taking any medications now? No, I'm taking a few now. Uh, doctors have to tell you what they are, I don't know. Mm -hmm. They cut them down so I could try new pills so they could see how that, mm -hmm. how I respond to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I hope those medications aren't affecting your sex life too much. Some of them do. Well, it's, it's like I said, it's been eight months. Mm -hmm. I've tried different ways and it doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't work. It doesn't operate right. No. you did too. I'd do it in this world to back me up the way I was. But that factory's not going to open up again, right? No, no. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, it's dead. So sort of has to start your life all over again. You know, some kind of How do you go to a factory that's hiring and be honest on your registration and tell them you how many months I've been in the hospital, been the hospital would be hired? They would they wouldn't give you two no, they wouldn't give you two looks, right? No. Mm -hmm. Well the best of luck in what you're trying to do with Something comes to finally get a stroke of luck your way. God, something's got to go good sooner or later. Well, nice to see you, fellow. Yes, sir. Sorry, it's been so no grim. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to ask me? Or? Anything you want to ask me? Or? Yes. Uh, 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 what do you actually do? I'm supposed to be a teacher. A teacher? Yeah. Fortunately, I got a job. Mm -hmm. You don't know of any, any other drugs that would help you? Yeah? No, I really don't I ever hurt. The things they said, they tried a lot of different things. Don't be surprised if they drug me a lot of different things. said they got a new new drug they're going to try. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's always things coming along we don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. Let's hope so. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. There his wife is sitting at home. Yeah, she can't lift anything or do very much either. He didn't want her to have that take a chance on that operation because she might have been totally disabled herself, right? And he, would, he said he wouldn't have any more chance to get a hot meal. Probably true. Perhaps we could, what would 
possibly be helpful is the idea of the psychopathic personality, which I think we've, to some extent, gotten away from by the DSM-3 description of antisocial personality, particularly in the VA systems where we see these DSM-3 caricatures of the description. It's so obvious. But the, whereas your description earlier, I realized it's a lot more subtle and commingled with the idea of, of hysteria. Mm -hmm. uh, to the degree that some of the processes are not as apparent either to people providing care or to the individual himself. So the idea of secondary gain certainly has been an issue we've been concerned about. I think perhaps you could discuss that. I mean, more your idea of the classic psychopathic personality, if you will. Well, I don't mean to say that he is a psychopathic I know. person. I don't. I'm, I'm just wondering that at all. all. I mean, this, this, this discussion came up around the issue of whether this was a depression or a response to the, the allegedly traumatic experiences in Vietnam and, and since, or, or whatever, right? And uh, you made the point earlier that when he first showed up, it was much more a depressive picture, and then and it became more and more suggestive of some post-traumatic thing. And, uh, and whether that was indeed, you know, something that developed out of his own psychology, or whether, as you implied, perhaps he had talked with other people in the in the, in the VA who had who were having that diagnosis. Diagnosis. And it certainly becomes a very central matter to his to the pension requirements that he gets under these circumstances. Um, But the, uh, the, the older 19th century idea of psychopathy was, of course, that there were people who were, who were morally, constitutionally inferior, who, who simply did not uh, have the kind of uh, moral standards and personal fortitude which enabled them to, uh, to both abide by the rules of society on the one hand and undertake the demands of society in terms of independence self-support, etc. on the other. Interesting kind of notion. And, uh, and as the English and American diagnostic systems went along, psychopathy became more and more associated with antisocial behavior, and the concept of a psychopathic character uh, was left behind. And, uh, and that's particularly the case in the DSM-3 description of psychopathy. And this leaves out a lot of people who are often seem indistinguishable from outright uh, criminal psychopaths. People who, for example, are, are doctors and uh, forge uh, their data and experiments and who seem otherwise really often extraordinary characters. Also many people who are extremely creative, not only in terms of forging data, but in often in the arts and sciences and professions have a uh, indifference to other people, a ruthlessness often that uh, doesn't fit easily in any particular uh, compartment. Um, and as you know, the, the growing interest in defining different character types uh, has developed narcissistic, borderline, et cetera, character types, often many of which overlap with, with some of these uh, so-called psychopathic characters. So the present general situation is, uh, is uh, uh, clouded, to say the least. My own experience, as I was saying before we started with so-called psychopathic people, who might, the ones I've gotten to know well, and I've gotten to know a couple of murderers pretty well, and I, I have in my practice now a man who pretended to be a clinical psychologist for 18 years, who was eventually found Cheating the Blue Cross out of enormous amounts of money and sent very briefly to jail. Don't worry if you ever get caught for your white collar crimes. You'll, you'll never suffer very much. And he's already out. Come back to see me. And, uh, he's a, he pretended to be a graduate of one of our clinical programs, which he had never attended at all, and got away with it for a Probably a very successful psychotherapist, too. 
and uh, uh, he, that man was much more typical of, of, of the sociological account of psychopathy than one or two others I've known. He was an orphan, and his father was a, was a, was a low class, I mean, a small time criminal. And he had moved from one foster home to another as a child, so far as I know. And uh, that, of course, is the typical story of the criminal psychopath. To those people who are not interested in the criminal psychopath, they should think twice because of the only syndrome in all psychiatry which we have ever done prospective studies to show a relationship between early experience and early character type and later psychopathy. The only thing we've ever been able to demonstrate a connection is in psychopathy. And uh, for example, if you if you take a thousand people who are brought up in an orphanage, you can't do this anymore because people aren't in orphanages, but there used to be populations like that. You take a thousand people brought up in an orphanage, and then you take another thousand people brought up by foster families. And then you try roughly to match another thousand people brought up in their families at birth. And the incidence of neurosis goes up as you go from orphanage to family at birth. The incidence of psychopathy goes down so that the orphanage family has the largest percentage of people that end up in jail if you define psychopathy that way. And then the, the, the Glucks, at, actually at the Harvard Law School, did the first prospective studies. Maybe you know all these things, the, the, the prospective studies. And uh, they were able to demonstrate uh, five loading factors, which are sufficiently strong so that the amount of variance that's involved allows you to predict at about an 80-85% basis who'll be in jail at 18. And that's really extraordinary. These aren't retrospectives, these are prospectives. Let me tell you who, which, which of you will go to jail. It's, it's men who at the age of four, six, or eight are, are active, aggressive males. And then, and then, and mesomorphs. Mesomorphs means that your, that your trunk length in relation to your limb length is average. In other words, you don't have, I'm, a, I'm an ectomorph. I have long legs and a relatively short trunk. Kept you out of trouble? <laughs> kept me out of trouble. I kept me looking at books and out of trouble. And uh, mesomorph, they're also called athletic as opposed to picnic or aesthetic. So aggressive male mesomorph. Now, those are the first three loading factors. The, um, as you know, endomorphs, that is, Big trunks and short legs have a very heavy loading for manic depressive disease. Um, in the European studies, the Americans have never liked that stuff. Um, so aggressive male mesomorphs, kids now, you can do this from hey, youngsters. And then the other two loading factors are the family structure. One family member is missing for long periods of time in the child, childhood. And the other thing, the other discipline provided by the other parent is grossly inconsistent. Now that's a very subjective factor, but what the Glucks meant by inconsistent discipline was inconsistent discipline. I mean, for example, one night you're sleeping with your mummy, the next night mummy breaks your bones, breaks your femur. So there's a somewhat erratic relationship between the parent and the child. And that pattern, over a considerable period of time, <coughs> carries with it a very heavy incident. So my imposter, my clinic would-be clinical psychologist imposter met those, those criteria very, very clearly. The uh, curious, what, what has he come to see you for now that he's passed the legal? I mean, obviously, I would gather he's nonetheless experiences considerable misery. Right. But it, it's a. Uh, he has two reasons to come and see me, one of which is obvious, the other which is, is speculative, from my point of view. The obvious reason is that if he, can, if he can get me to sign a document saying that he is sick, he will then 
get his income raised to his pre-sentence level because before he got in trouble, he's, he, he bought an insurance policy which guarantees his income if he's sick. <laughs> and the reason he's come to do that for me, he had somebody else doing it before as the other guy retired. So his, his first reason for coming to see me is that. And I told him I couldn't do that. And we had that out together. And, uh, and then he said he still wanted to come and see me. And uh, so why, and I, I don't know whether he will. But if he does, the other reason to come to see me is a reason that was first, I don't mean in his particular case, this is the reason, but the, the, the reason that's in the books that might have pertained to him is a reason that was, uh, was first made clear by August Eichhorn, the Viennese educator who became part of the psychoanalytic movement, who, by the way, was the analyst for Heinz Koha, your famous neighbor in Chicago, now dead, who was probably, the, in my opinion, the most important psychoanalytic figure in American psychiatry in the last 25 years. He, Koha was August Eichhorn's analysis. And uh, August Eichhorn was an extraordinary man. And, and if you're interested in this subject, and I hope everybody is, because it's one of the great subjects, if you're interested in the problem of quote, misbehavior or psychopathic personality or, you know, if you can get over your moralistic attitudes toward these things, terribly important matter. Um, read a book called Wayward Youth by August Eichhorn. And in it, Eichhorn spells out, not very clearly, his later essays were clearer, he fell under the influence of, of Anna Freud and something, and she helped him clarify his ideas. But he had his ideas himself, too. And this is, this is what August Eichhorn noticed. In his school for young kids, he wasn't the first to notice this, he was the first to speak about it in a clear-headed way, it seems to me. In his school, he noticed that the young kids would steal from him. He had a, stu a, he had a school for delinquent kids. They would steal from him. They would steal his clothing, they would steal his paper and pencils and pens. Uh, and he also noticed, to his eternal credit, that they also stole his ideas. <laughs> I.e., not his ideas about psychoanalysis, but the phrases he would use, the words he would speak. They would find, in other words, they were great imitators. Now, now you see what's happening here. We're, we're taking the idea of imitation and identification and linking it up with impostorship, right? So now suddenly we have a connection between people that uh, steal and people that copy. So we're beginning to get into the whole human race now, right? <laughs> now what, what, what Eichhorn did that was not unique, certainly, because many of the religious leaders of schools, like the father who ran Boys Town, have done this forever, but he did it in a more self-conscious way, perhaps. What Eichhorn did was, instead of getting mad at these kids for stealing from them, like any good, sound, honest American parent should. Instead of getting mad at these kids, he welcomed them. He saw it as a kind of flattery. He said, Jesus, they must need me. So instead of turning on them and spanking them because they stole his ideas or his clothing or whatever, he said, oh, come on, have some more. I'm, I'm rich. Take it. If you want to be like me, I'm flattered. And he was a very, very fine man, a very generous man, as you can see. He was also a very firm man. He didn't, he didn't allow them to get away with too much because what he would do now was to say, if you want more of me, you've got to behave a certain way. And he, he, made, a, he made a trade off with them. And, and you see, they loved him. They loved him so much they wanted to be him. And he in turn said, I love you too, but you really got to be like me. You can't just, uh, you can't just take pieces of me. And, and so they, they made a trade off. And he graduated, so he says, I have never checked up on it. He graduated, many people went out, and they weren't little August icons, but they, were, they led sometimes exemplary and helpful lives. So now they got into our literature, the idea, and those of you who have read Heinz Cohen know how close his ideas are to this. They got into the psychoanalytic literature in our psychiatry, the idea that perhaps a mutual admiration society might be a, an important developmental event 
And people who didn't have parents that loved them or, and who offered some kind of example to them might later on gain it through this kind of mutual admiration society. Now, this had to be a mutual admiration society. It couldn't just be one hour a week. Hence the importance of his community, right? And then if you think about something like AA, you see that you're already on very broad ground. Because in AA, you have your own kind of people with your own kind of problems who really want to look after you. And you have a common structure of ideals, the famous 12 steps. And you begin to talk about sort of re-parentification, remoralization in people that are not above you or below you, but on your same level, who with you can share, you can identify with. And you know if you know, if you know about AA, and everybody should know about AA, you know that this is a, a serious commitment. Your, your sponsor doesn't come to you, you, you don't go to your sponsor and call him up and tell him you're in trouble. Your sponsor knows you, knows that Friday the 13th of May is the time your wife left you, and he looks you up that day and spends the day with you. So the chances for identification, mutual admiration, and for real internalization and change are greatly increased. And of course, if you form day AA, you go four or five times a week. This is a new, this is a society. This isn't just treatment and intervention. So it has crept into, and more than crept, it's almost a tide now, has, has come to the treatment of the behavior disorders. Let's include, loosely speaking, alcoholism. Uh, it's this concept of a kind of remoralization, re-identification, mutual admiration society, and a, a treatment system that given the rarely found conditions, may be quite effective. So you have this curious situation where the sort of the, the foundling child of all psychiatry, the last described of all our great syndromes, psychopathy, is the only one where we have a prospective studies of the ideological factors and perhaps a systematic treatment with really quite startling results in many cases. But it remains a foundling of our of our psychiatry, I think because we're because psychiatry is still a very young thing. And like all the young groups, we still think we're priests and lawyers. You know, the anthropologists tell us that when the helping professions begin, the shaman is a, in the prim, so-called primitive tribe, it's hard to tell who's primitive, but it, it, in the, in the so-called primitive tribes, the, the shaman is the lawgiver, he's the priest, the moral center, and he's also the doctor. And as civilization, so-called, advances, we separate out, but we are still shaman. We, we still are moralists. We still don't like bad people. But when we really become psychiatrists, then we won't worry about silly things like whether people do good things or bad things. We'll just take care of them, and we'll, then we'll attain some kind of good function. Do you think if the, if the uh, uncredentialed psychotherapist comes back to you, it would be to to be able to get more to imitate? Well, thank you for adding that. That completes my story, right? That's the point. That's the possible second reason he might come back. Maybe he wants to form a mutual admiration society with me. He said some things over the course of the time that suggested that he might want to do that. And that's all right with me. But I can't, you see, I can't sign his thing for him, as I told him, because I told him that if he and I are really going to work out some way by which he can go straight, I can't start it off by him. By, by pretending to, to what he calls a half-truth. He acknowledges it's a half-truth. I can't do that with him. Maybe this is somebody else. Maybe I should, but I can't. Maybe I'm being jealous. When I spoke about primitive societies, I meant to be apologetic because I'm, I'm a firm believer that the last word on civilization was said by Mahatma Gandhi. You know what he said? Or you should know if you don't. You know, they asked the great man, they asked Mahatma Gandhi what he thought of Western civilization, and he said, you know what he said? He said it would be that would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so is this man a psychopath? Because I'm talking as if he was, I don't know. He's, you know, he spelled out for us at some length that he's in a bad spot. He struck me more as a blue-collar Willie Loman than a psychopath. He, here was a fellow who, at least relativistically, had achieved something. He was, he was a healthy one who went into the service. His brother couldn't. Uh, 
he was the one who got married, the others didn't. He had a good job at one time, and that was down the tube. And, you know, he just doesn't know how to handle it. He's in this terrible dilemma that you pointed out that if he, in order to get a subsistence, and the best subsistence, he's got to feel worse, which feels lousy to him, and vice versa, if he feels better, he jeopardizes the subsistence. I wondered if you felt like pushing that dilemma more with him after you raised it. I really didn't. I didn't have the heart to. Maybe I should have. I mean, a poor bastard. He's a, well, he's got to solve it somehow. Well, I think he's going to solve if they if if they do what you know they probably he's probably going to if he has half a decent lawyer that he can arrange you know he'll get him and get the hundred percent disability at that point he might be open to some kind of psychological investigation but until that happens I don't see how he can play into that system no well it's just I think he it isn't a matter of his kidding other people in order. Yeah, he struck me as the kind of guy who has to kid himself. But, that, but that's what I mean, because until the, until the United States government comes along and says, you are a bona fide veteran, disabled veteran, he can't look at anything. Right, he's but too then can he give up the pretense that he's, already, that he's running on himself, even after he gets the benefit? I'm afraid he's stuck with this persona that, you know, that he's developed out of necessity. Well, but but he he's a he's a wounded veteran. I mean, that seems to be a livable persona, no? Maybe not. Hope you're wrong. You might be right. I hope I'm wrong too. But I don't see any way out of that for him. I mean, out of the the successful disability claim. I mean, his marriage suggests that the two of them, you know, clinging to each other. I mean, he maybe. You know, you can easily, some, uh, Jim could do this for us, tell us that, that, if, that from a family point of view, family systems point of view, it, it may be absolutely crucial that they both be just totally disabled. They're going to have any kind of relationship with each other at all. He even had some of Willie Loman's symptomatology, the blackouts, the loss of short-term memory, mm -hmm. dependence on his wife. Mm -hmm. You wonder what goes on between the son and and to carry that a little farther, you know. The son's departure seems to be very important right now. They, you know, God knows if the son is shouting at him, right? And I would have more confidence in what you're saying if we had a picture of what happens when he goes home. Yeah. I mean, well, I'm glad you don't have any confidence. What I don't, I don't mean it to apply to him. I don't understand it. No, I meant in terms of, in other words, if the hypothesis that you're inclined to, which which feels right, I mean, it's, it's a plausible one, it would... It would, then we would get the picture of certain things happening. In other words, in, in the, we have this pattern. He goes into the hospital, he gets better, huh? And then he goes home, and then whatever goes on between him and the son and the wife would give us data for and against what you're mm -hmm. saying, I think. So, you know, we might expect a certain picture there if he has to do what he's doing, and um, if something else was going on. I mean, there are other possibilities besides the one you delineate. I mean, for example, um, he could uh, go home and then he finds he's taking care of her all the time and she's not reciprocating and he has a lot of rage. I feel a lot of undercurrent of rage here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just what goes on between him and the wife such that he goes home feeling all right and within a month or two is down the tubes. Now, that suggests a certain interaction, uh, which would be interesting. I, I would, How would you, that's an interesting separate problems, how to yeah. study that issue. That certainly has occurred to us because, you know, once you've sent somebody out two or three times and they can bounce them back in from the environment, you say, gee, there must be something out there. But it's like it's a black box that we can't throw light into from where we are. We've had well, the wife and the son in. So now he's impotent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which that. suggests more complications And sometimes it's about two or three months, by the way. Sometimes we'll see this in the course of a hospitalization. He's doing fine. He's sitting on for a, having gone for a weekend and he comes back terrible. We've seen, our, our team has seen a couple of these cases, one with uh, for Krishna, where they get, give this, you know, they give the antidepressant and, and the patient gets better. For instance, I'm thinking of one where the, the wife, the, let me see now, how's it go, that, um, this is the wife, this is a woman that gets better in the hospital and then goes home and, uh, 
and then she is with her son who fills the house with smoke and you know just kind of pollutes the place and within a month she's down again and then her daughter comes over and just orders her all over the place we had them in this room and the daughter was like sitting there the daughter was sitting like this you know with a with the mother and the son, you know, like this. It was very clear who was running things, but I mean, the dynamic of that was was uh, very straightforward. That that the between the, the bossy daughter who was, was delighted to be running things, this woman, you know, had has you know had lost her spirit, and then the son was helping her too. So that so they were very very powerful trio. I mean, there are a lot of different. I mean, I don't think there's any one picture that could end up. Um, with this man, you know, sort of flat again. There are a lot of ways a family could interact to bring that about. I don't think there's any one picture that would do it. Don't forget that when he goes home, he has to live on this income he's got with her. But see, I mean, I'm sort of say, adding something to what you're saying. You're, you're arguing as if the income and the, the need to have $24,000 instead of $10,000 suffices to explain the downward trend. It may. But it may, there may be other things in the interaction. I don't. I mean, one one only has one, one hypothesis. Know, one is uh, one is a little bit. Um, and, and I don't mean to exclude the other because they yeah, may interact with they each other. They may interact. Well, I mean, for, for example, did he made it? Did he, you know, did he make a deal with his wife when when he said she shouldn't have this operation to cure her back because he wanted, didn't want to run the risk of her not cooking him a, a hot meal? Let's you know, to make anything of that is to make. A lot of we don't know very much about, but say that, say that was the deal. That you're going to live in pain for the rest of your life, so I get my hot meal on the chance that you might not be able to make my hot meal for you if you had that operation. So what's hurt? What's that? What's the quid pro quo for that? You're supporting me in a proper manner, perhaps, mm -hmm. which you can't maybe do with that amount of money. I don't know. And then if you move back another another power, mm -hmm. uh, then you got the mother uh, being promised retirement and the sick brother and there's only one brother who's really financially well off mm -hmm. and so this is another possible solution which is to get more money mm -hmm. well that couples with the son's wish to go to college which has been a big problem for him for two years it's his concern about how he was going to support the son and the mother you know and by the way i don't know if it matters or not but he turned 40 around the time of all this yeah. well, well this this is the this is i did you know this is another way of looking at psychopathy impresses me the longer I'm in practice is that the, uh, the, I mean for example this orphan imposter was a person that, that was terribly under the under the influence of his of his ambitious wife and and, uh, and a, an ambitious uh, mother-in-law who wanted him to be a very very successful breadwinner and uh, you can make a case that one of the reasons this guy did these really, uh, uh, quote, bad things was to try to bring some satisfaction to these, these quite uh, forbidding wife and mother-in-law. And, and you know that one of the ideas, one of the interesting ideas that modern descriptive psychiatry has brought us, I think one of the few understand is, if I may say so, is that the is that there's a relationship between psychopathy and hysteria. Now that, that is not an entirely new idea, but it's been put on a little firmer foundation. Um, that is the idea that, that women get hysterical and men get psychopathic. And that uh, and the evidences for that are, in terms of family studies, that, that men in a family where there's a female hysteric tend to be psychopathic. That's the claim of the Cousay group in St. Louis. But there's, a, there's another link between the two of them, which in some ways is even firmer. And that is that if you look at the traditional Cleckley version of description of psychopathy, it's very like hysteria, because the psychopathic man is charming, self-centered, dependent, and manipulative, all traits which have always been part of the classical description of the hysterical character. So. Uh, so, and, and don't forget that suggestible is in that hysterical mm -hmm. portion. And that's the part of, of the psychopathic people that I have gotten to know very well that surprised me. Instead of being a sort of cold-blooded killer, you know, that sort of picture, the psychopathic people I've known have been very suggestible. 
And that's in keeping with what Einkorn noticed. Because these young kids were very strongly, their behavior was very strongly amenable or suggestible to, to the way Icorn acted. They were like empty vessels waiting to be filled. And, uh, and another patient I have who was sent to me because the back to the residency director at a certain program was so angry about one of the members of his staff and thought he was, you know, was making all kinds of psychopathic trouble. And uh, he turned out to be a, a really a quite a dear, sweet person who was who had the independence of a baseball in the World Series. And he was just bouncing from one person to another, trying as best he could to satisfy these different people. And he was driven to do some really pretty outrageous things in the course of keeping all these plates, excuse my switching metaphors, all these plates up in the air. And, uh, and just as soon as I could imbue him with a little courage, soon give him a feeling that, well, to hell with some of these people, you know, let's find out what you want. As soon as I could give him some courage, he became a quite exemplary citizen. Now that's just the reverse of what you'd think from the traditional picture of the psychopath who's supposed to be all courage, all dripping the rest of us, going around, you know, uh, making his way despite what we think. But here was a guy once who had the strength to get some support and having the strength of his convictions became really quite a respectable person. What was your sense of this guy's loneliness? Hmm? What was your sense of this guy's loneliness? It's from via the TV. He looked like he was just this pitiful, all in the world, hard spot, shit, this is my last chance kind of guy. I don't know what to think. I don't know whether that's a magnificent performance that is liable to wrest some more of your tax dollars away from you, or, or whether it's a account of the inner suffering of a different sort. I challenge anybody to separate those things out. I've been thinking about what you said before about the society, uh, stuff with AA people, and then a group that uh, some of us have worked in at North Mount High become a really retirement group of people who are at least partially service-connected. And one that Bob and uh, I led had uh, an individual in who had a real similar history. Drop attacks, not psychop psychopathy, not able to meet the demands of the, of the society, still not really having all the, uh, unfortunately this guy didn't do as well as, as the patient today and that people uh, started labeling pseudo-seizures and uh, just trying to get something for himself. But once he got into this group of 12 individuals and started to uh, uh, see other people had difficulties and we encouraged his empathy and others, all of a sudden he became a sterling citizen uh, and quite uh, uh, responsive to their needs and quite uh, feeling well about himself mm -hmm. and quit going after more service-connected compensation. Mm -hmm. Which he had just fought. In fact, he'd have seizures up and down the hall at the VA until mm -hmm. somebody would have known. Just amazing. I'd like to pursue this because I had another thought, another way that I've looked at situations like Mr. Logan or perhaps at him. And I'm not, some of the terms I'm going to use, I know that others have used before, ego psychologists have talked about ad adaptational dynamics. The need to do whatever you have to do to survive. Mm -hmm. Very similar to what you're talking about, but it takes away that that colorful and colored word, yeah, well, psychopath, which I know creates flags and, and it's been difficult for us to see this man. But I think it's very true when you think about the circumstances that we've talked about, of family members and pressures and perhaps developmental issues in life itself, in middle life or whatever. Uh, you begin to wonder if that doesn't have a great deal to do with shaping the kind of behaviors that we're seeing that in fact lose their basis in a moral issue and a moral grounding. And one does what one has to do to survive, as you've been saying very much all along. Adaptation. So perhaps it's something that's very tempting to me to think that way. But if I think I were in his situation, would I be scrupulous? <laughs> I don't think so. Well when you look at I can't our imagine I've having watched my behavior over the years and I can't imagine my my uh, behaving differently. I probably wouldn't behave be so quite so convincing. You know, when it, you know, when it comes to the protection of your loved ones, mm -hmm. who isn't prepared to cheat and steal? I certainly am. I wondered if you could I, say But I like your, I think your, I think your language is much more cleansing than these other terms. Adaptation, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, I love to watch those. I don't watch them anymore because it reminds me too much of life at Harvard. But if you, if you read those, watch those British broadcasting pictures of life on the Brazilian jungle floor, you know, is a my favorite one. That's why when I stop watching it, this little round innocent beetle starts across the path of the camera, right? And then it comes zooping down from the other side of the line of red ants. The little beetle was just wandering across the path, you know, innocent as could be, and, and the ants arrived and no more beetle. And that was that's going on all the time, right? What a beetle world. And you have to admire a man who might be able to fight for his survival in this fashion. When so many of our people just fold up and end up curled up in a ball in the corner of our state hospitals or jump off the bridges and do all kinds of things. I, I was tempted, but I felt I would be using him, so I didn't have the heart to do it. I was tempted to discuss suicide more with him. And I could maybe you could make a case for why suicide really isn't the way out. I mean, for example, I, I would like to know whether the whether the government would continue his 50% pension to his wife if uh, if he committed suicide. Mm -hmm. I doubt that they would. No, it's lost. It. So he's trapped in life. How about an accidental death? I know, but that's hard to pull Death off. benefits don't use a follow-up from the VA system. Mm -hmm. So I think he, he's stuck in life in a way many of us are not. Mm -hmm. I thought that was an important detail about whether he owned his house or But all of you who rent take take lesson from that. <laughs> so uh, another complicating factor to me was when Steve mentioned the expectation of sending his son to college. Mm -hmm. This fellow does have rather high expectations. Mm -hmm. He's not willing to. It's not so easy to slide into the lowest rung of the lower class and uh, have it a subsistence existence. If you want your children, I don't know how many they are, to do better. Have aspirations, and this man has had some success up through his thirties, mm -hmm. I guess. Yep. Had some prospects. They were uh, making thirty-five thousand dollars a year. He said. I, as an aside, I don't think it's significant, but uh, I did find out to my surprise last week he mentioned his son's birthday, which he had missed. <coughs> that turned out to be his, and he also mentioned that it was about four or five days. Now, how did that work? I can't remember how this came up, but it just came up last week that his anniversary was, was last week and he was going to, yeah, he was going to send his wife a card and I asked him which anniversary it was. It was his 19th, which is only about uh, four months before this son was born. And I mentioned that passing to him. He said, yeah, well, that was, that was there, that his wife was pregnant when they were married with this boy. Mm -hmm. But, but I think a lot of that speaks to the sense that, that there's not a total lack of moral character yeah. or ideals in this man by any means. Um, but he's trapped. Mm -hmm. And there comes a point at which, uh, what's it called? Uh, not relative. Situational ethics sort of takes over on a person by person basis. Feel that there's not much we can do for him until the money is settled. Well, you can do a lot for him if you want it. Might be settled. Because one of the things I was told was that they would read the what's written in the charts about his illness. And with this administration in, in Washington, I'm sure they read it pretty closely. Let's talk about that by a minute, because it's it's one I've been aware of since I've been in the system. Apart from whether or not one feels a man like this should get this ability and use our tax dollars in that way, which that I believe is an individual issue. If one's goal is to help this person to the best adaptation that they can have, how do you carry that out? How do you, uh, I, mean, I think this guy does suffer, but I wonder if he doesn't suffer because of this <coughs> sense he has at some level, perhaps not fully conscious or fully available to him that he's compromising himself in some very important ways. So if we, quote, help him, um, how do we help him with that body? I don't know. I swear there are many other people I can think. 
<laughs> I'm not a, I, I have never had the judicial temperament. I've always found that in any discussion, I tend to take the underdog. I can, I'm sure that a more Solomon-esque person would tell me that I would often make the mistake. I don't have the executive clarity of mind to deal with it. Well. Yeah. No one will be able to speak after you've said that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to cheat. my constituency by that number, right? Mm -hmm. I figure that the doctors have no place in this. I don't think we should worry because there are lots of other people on the other side taking very good care. Maybe that's a moral cop out. It appeals to me. Well, you, you, there's somebody else who that way. <laughs> are you angry at the surgeon that set John Wilkes Booth's broken leg after he shot Lincoln? Yeah. That, that's, that's one of the great moments in American moral history when this southern idiot who just killed perhaps our greatest president came staggering into his surgery asking to be healed. The surgeon fixed him up, nearly got lynched because of it too. I thought I sort of liked that. I don't know that I'd have the courage to do it myself, but I sort of thought it was an admirable thing to do. Should you, should you, in a battlefield, should you heal the wounds of the enemy? That's a Talk to people who work in the American Red Cross about the history of that problem. The Nazis told their doctors they must not minister to allied wounded. That's a good guide. <laughs> which has, which should have precedence? The nation state or the health of the people? Is that putting it unfairly? <laughs> Which should have precedence? The national income or the, or the uh, salvation of, of this family structure? I don't know. I always, I always know where my heart is, what I vote. That's one of the problems with the caucus. I don't, wish, I don't know where his heart is. I know where his pocketbook is. <laughs> I don't think we can be neutral because if they read the record, just one use of the word psychopath, and you'll have determined how it comes out. That's yeah. true. Uh, especially since there are all these people on the other side looking. I, I guess I'm having some trouble going along with that. I, I see this man as more defeated and maladaptive than psychopathic and manipulative. Uh, well, I do, I, do, he's very, I, do, I do too. <clears throat> I agree with you. Well, if he is, uh, Sam Goldman said that the most important thing in acting is honesty, and once you can fake that, you'll be a success. <laughs> uh, you know, either, That's a great line. Either he's very, very good at it, or he really you know, does feel defeated and is being maladaptive, and then we should be able to help him. Isn't that our business? To break up maladaptive kinds of responses. And it may cost him $24,000 a year to do it, but maybe we could offer him something better in return. And he's not going to change until somebody does offer him something better. Well, that's, that's the principle it's operating on me. I don't think you're going to get anywhere until this whole thing is settled. Mm -hmm. And it isn't going to be settled until he gets his money. Well, Aaron, I'm curious, what's, if, from what we understand so far, what's maladaptive about what he's doing? If we assume that what he is doing, what he's presenting to us, he's, he's, like, he's giving up his peace of mind, he's having to be depressed, he's got to lose an enormous sense of uh, dignity and self-regard, you know, to be this patient. Uh, he's got to jeopardize his relationship within the family, his immediate family as well as uh, his original family with the other brothers. He's giving up this position of a relatively status, of a relatively successful person to a failure, an awful, defeated, you know, person. That's got to be a big cost to him. You know, if 
if there was some way to give them some of those things back and make them enough money, uh, yeah. he, he could have both. He could, he, he could have his twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year plus some self-respect, some narcissistic supply, that kind of thing. He, that's what he's paying for this. You know, I think unconsciously he's going for the twenty four grand, but he's paying an enormous price for it. Well maybe we can help him with that second part by supporting him in his effort to get it. Well again, my concern would be that if he's successful in getting it, he'll never be able to give up the new image that he's developed for himself. Well he can have that image though and at the same time maybe learn to do something else too. Well the question is whether we can do both or whether we are limited in our power to uh, but our position is, our, I mean, if his position is compromised, ours is just as compromised. Yeah. Because we are servants of the state, some of us, right? We could put it that way. For <laughs> <laughs> we should. Put that after your name. That's all that is. We want our own DSOS. Well, you are. <laughs> you can't help it. You're, you're compromised too. It, 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 I think that's part of the, the depressing thing about the whole case is that, I mean, if he's giving up his, his uh, sex, you know, his, his, uh, his penis and his sexuality, and he's giving up his, his pride, and he's giving up his position in the extended family, there's a tremendous sort of undertow to all of this, I think. And I think that's, I think that's uh, felt, you know, I can feel it in the room. There's something really, mm -hmm. oh, you know, <coughs> case that, and it seems uh, it's it, uh, it's hard to bear this case, I think, in that way, because mm -hmm. there's that feeling of what's being given up. The trade-off is, is very bad. So if there were some way, but the problem is, I mean, what, how, I mean, if if we feel the trade-off at all those different levels is very depressing and lugubrious and so on. I mean, what way, in fact, what competes with the twenty-four thousand dollars? I mean, that's the challenge of the case. We talk about systems issues, and, and this is one that one, at least if you, if you <coughs> stay sensitive to patients and to what's, what you think is good for people, yeah. uh, and you work in a system like the VA, you begin to question, you know, in the sense of being a servant of the state, is this any less abusive, this system that can do this to an individual, than a system that on some occasions can take away individual liberties and rights and put people away because they don't agree with their opinions? And I'm talking about Soviet state use of psychiatry in that sense. Now, there's not a state-dominated, you know, I don't think the, the parallel is very close at all. And it's, I hope, more inadvertent in our system than directed. But individuals are abused, in a sense, in the way we're talking about here. Yeah. Without, on the other hand, there are a number of individuals that we work with that desperately need mm -hmm. this kind of income that really cannot su suffice. Mm -hmm. So how do you... Become a servant of the state and let this happen. <coughs> well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've already told you, ad nauseum said what I think about it. But I, you know, in any system where you give people things, some people are going to cheat you. Mm -hmm. But I, I, would, uh, I still think it's worth that. I, would, I, don't, I, don't, I won't worry about that. Because if you introduce a system as the Republicans have been doing for some time now, where you make it so difficult to give anybody anything because you're worried about the people that cheat you, and you deprive all kinds of other people of things that they need. And, and you're not going to find out who's cheating anyway. It doesn't, that doesn't work. I think you just have to run that, run that risk. And I'm not, I'm not saying that he's cheating us, because I share your feeling about it. Well, he's not cheating us anymore than he's cheating himself. Yeah, that's the... That's, yeah, that's what's so painful about the case. Christ, well, what, yeah, what is well, Christ? Christ. Yeah. I mean, we'll all go away from the room today, yeah. <laughs> But uh, what will he go away with you? Mm -hmm. Is he this said, a good place to stop? Do you want to? Well, I just have one question. He said to me that if he got that extra, that he would be happy. You know, that that would that's the one thing you could imagine that it would cure his depression. But he's got to keep being depressed to keep that, doesn't he? No, no, no. no, 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 no once he's got it, periodically. Once he's got it, every year, Milwaukee. He got the bells. He's going to come in for common sense. And if anybody shakes his car, has been a movement. I mean, there has been a movement to review that. Periodical. Oh, it is yeah, periodical. Yeah. Oh, right. And to really review it, you know, it's just oh. like in New York State, the doctor's going to have to be recertified. Well, I'm sure if, if we continue with these kinds of policies, there'll be more and more. <laughs> Did you read about that? Mm -hmm. 
Th now that's a systems issue that, <laughs> that the political would come very clear because we see it in the VA all the time. You start to challenge these people once they're on this kind of uh, disability, and all you do is increase hospitalization costs by, you know, tenfold because every time a review comes up, you get people that are so sick they can't isn't possibly that get that one that minute in three weeks. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that system, and that's already. And who's to know whether that's rough doctor, Will we get better or worse if they make us take another exam? <laughs> worse. Oh, definitely worse. <laughs> in Massachusetts, the doctors are threatened to leave. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see the Can't doctor withdraw the order, man. Mass. Boston yeah. goes to see or what? <laughs> but by the other doctors in the window. Should we stop here? Okay, we'll resume tomorrow.